came into the group very uh, uh, boldly and <laughs> sat down and we talked and we introduced each other. And he's a delightful person. Um, and it's, I, I tell you, I'm a sucker for an Irish accent. <laughs> so uh, he and I sat down uh, to talk about uh, uh, machine learning and AI. And, and he showed me this uh, multi part talk uh, that he's been giving at the Harvard, essentially the Harvard retired people's continuing yeah. education. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, it was it was a wonderful forty five minutes that we spent. I I, I really uh, was impressed with what he had. So what I asked him to do was to, if he'd be willing to give that talk, or maybe in sort of three parts. And so this today will be the first part. And uh, without any further ado, let me turn it over to Connor. Okay, thanks, Harry. And uh, thanks, Harry, for your guidance with regards to content. I'm relatively new to the group, so I appreciate how you helped shape um, what we're going to cover. Uh, last night, I asked Bing Image Creator to create an image, and I use this prompt, an artificial intelligence robot in the pose of the thinker statue by Auguste Rodin. Uh, I was pretty impressed with what it gave me back. I also asked it to give me... Now, excuse me, is that a real picture that it just read, or did it no, figure it out by itself? It literally drew it by itself. If you want, we can have a follow-on session about AI image generation, which might be interesting. Um, I also asked it to give me a logo for the Lexington Computer and Technology Group. <laughs> I said featuring a Minuteman hat and a computer. And this is really small, but there's there's a Minuteman soldier on a laptop there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a bad idea either. Either. Okay, so this is going to be a three-part series. And again, thanks, Harry, for helping um, figure out the uh, the agenda here. Um, the first two sessions are what I would term as not technical. We're going to deal with some technical terms in there, but you don't need any technical knowledge to absorb them. The third one is a bit going to be a bit more technical. I'll try to make it as consumable as possible, but we're going to get into matrix multiplication and all sorts of fun uh, when we're in that section. So the first session, this session, we're just going to introduce ChatGPT. Really, it's going to be about using ChatGPT. Uh, the second session is going to be delving into, okay, how smart is this thing? And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be presenting a number of viewpoints uh, from different uh, academics and thinkers uh, regarding their, their opinion on that. And then the third session is going to go into uh, the architecture behind these systems and how they actually work. I think once you get to the third session and we start going through that, the penny will start to drop for a lot of people with regards what exactly we're dealing with here. So before I go any further, my first interaction with uh, ChatGPT was um, it was about between two and three years ago, almost three years ago, in my last day-to-day -day operational role at the company, uh, we were using this technology. Uh, at the time, I had a very uh, cursory understanding um, of the technology. Since then, I got a bit more interested, started reading some of the academic papers upon which it was based, um, and have started consuming news, of which there is a lot. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert, but I've got a, enough of a working knowledge uh, to help, hopefully help you guys understand. Okay, so really high level, what is ChatGPT? It's a chatbot. So in other words, you can interact with it by, to use the technical terms, issuing prompts and getting responses. It was developed by a company called OpenAI, an interesting company. Uh, they actually had, uh, the original mission was to, to create safe AI. Um, it was actually the brainchild of Elon Musk. 
um, together with Sam Altman, who at the time was running an organization called Y Combinator. They came together along with a number of very prominent people in Silicon Valley uh, and started bandying this around, primarily driven by Elon Musk's concerns about the potential for AI to be harmful. Uh, when they were originally founded, they were a nonprofit. Um, as they went on, they found that they needed a lot more money than the billion dollars they started with. And they needed to raise some money and they started to evolve. And now they're an interesting model, which is a capped profit model. The investors will get back uh, returns up to a certain cap. At that time, OpenAI will buy them back, buy back their, their shares, uh, and they'll be out and, and OpenAI will, will, have, will control their shares from that point on. ChatGPT itself was launched in November 2022. So as I mentioned, it was about three years ago when I first came across this technology. At that time, it was not in the guises of a chatbot. At that time, it was in the guises of an API that companies could use to build their products on top of these capabilities. Once the chatbot was launched, very quickly, it became big news. In fact, um, it became the fastest growing consumer application in history with 100 million users in two months. The current count is somewhere north of 200 million users. So, very common usage. Um, now, ChatGPT is only one such chatbot. There are many other chatbots that are out there. This chatbot is built on top of what's known as a large language model. We'll get more into that as we go forward. There are also many large language models out there. Um, you may have noticed that the prediction for what you're typing on your phone has gotten a lot better. Uh, that's in part because Apple have deployed uh, what they term tiny large language model on your phone that does a much better job of predicting what you're typing. Um, so this chatbot has been trained on all sorts of text, books, academic articles, Wikipedia, blog posts, and a lot more. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see more details about that I believe next week when we, we talk about the training of the system. Okay, so <clears throat> these letters GPT actually do have a meaning. This is GPT is an acronym. Generative is the G, it generates stuff, whether it's generating text or images or moves in a game or whatever the case may be. P is for pre-trained. It's been trained in advance. So for instance, if you have used ChatGPT, you've probably used the free version that's available, which had been tra trained almost two years ago now. Um, that is starting to shift some of the newer um GPT models do have an incremental learning capability. So it's not going to be the case of it's trained over several months at a point in time, and that's the limit of its knowledge. Some of the newer models are, are actually going to have knowledge beyond uh, that time. And the, the T stands for transformer. It's based on the transformer architecture. We're going to deal with that in part three. Uh, we'll go into the transformer architecture in some pretty good detail. Um, it was a, uh, a development that really made all of this possible. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing more about that when we get to it. So you've probably encountered some of these, but there are a selection of uses for ChatGPT, from writing content like essays and letters, emails and poems and jokes, limericks, songs, songs in a particular style, uh, writing computer programming code, it's reasonably good at that. Answering questions and explaining concepts. Creating menus, recipes, and shopping lists. 
translating languages. Translating languages is what the underlying architecture was originally designed to do. We'll talk more about that. There are some key aspects to translating languages that then we accidentally found out were really good for the types of use cases we have today. Like a lot of innovation, it's, it's built upon several layers of innovation, some of which, quite frankly, was, you know, accidental to a certain degree uh, with regards, you know, some of the consequences were not expected. Uh, but thankfully, um, they did work out in the way they have. Um, ChatGPT is also good for role-playing scenarios like interviews, working with data, in tables and graphs. This is this is one that's being used quite a lot um, in the corporate world right now. It's good for some games. Are you going to give some examples of that, that one? Yeah, we will. We're going to do that very quickly. Um, and it's also good for summarizing content like books and articles. Yeah, question. Um, is the program is it pro is it programmed to there are like ten points there is are there program parts of these chatbots that are trained to recognize when it's doing one of those things or yeah. or has it learned what an essay is and what a letter is and things like that? Okay, it has implicitly learned what these things are based on its training. We'll get into its training in more detail next week. But yes, it has not been told about the format, but it's been given good examples and it's figured out what, what to do to generate similar um, So, So outputs. if I were to ask it, um, please write an explanation of how to get to Lexington Center as a hip hop song. Yeah. It had never been trained as to how you do a hip hop. Would it, would it, if it had, if hip hop was in its training regime, yeah. would it have, would it be able to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Save, save that example. Yeah. So what? <laughs> save that example. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I did that with a, with a writing it right poem in the style of Robert Frost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, speaking of which, let's jump over and, and uh, do some examples here. So I'm going to start off really simple. It's going to be a bit of a mishmash of examples, but they're designed to capture some of the more impressive aspects of what ChatGPT can do. After I walk through this, we'll also talk about some of the limitations and we'll show some of those limitations as well. So let's start off with, tell me a joke. Sure, here's one for you. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. Oh. And so, <laughs> so this is pretty impressive because we, we've asked it to tell us a joke. First of all, understanding the concept of a joke. Second of all, coming up with the joke out of you know the vast amounts of training materials. It's not rehashing something it was trained on. It's creating something fresh. Connor, how, how do how do you how do we know it's not doing a very first search, very fast search, and saying, "Oh, this this was tagged as a joke, and here you know here's what it is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna reply, you know, like a normal yeah. a normal query." Well, so that's a really good question. In the past, the companies and organizations behind these types of technologies were very open with regards to their training materials, their architecture, their runtime, everything. And the reason they were so open is because, well, they wanted people to buy into it. They want, and they also wanted to advance. It wasn't as competitive. They were dealing with, you know, an area where there wasn't a lot of interest and there wasn't a lot of commercial activity. So back then they would write academic quality papers before releasing something that would talk in pretty good detail about what they were doing. More recently, they closed shop. 
They've said, okay, this is a competitive space now. We are not going to release inf information about what we're training these large language models on. We're not going to give an update on our, our, our current architecture. We're not going to talk about what we do at runtime. So we have a good idea as to what the situation was up until maybe 18 months ago. Since then, there's been a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, it, it's not as transparent. Um, however, there are a lot of people trying to reverse engineer what's going on and then writing either academic papers or academic-like papers. Um, and there are, you know, so we don't know for sure what's happening, but currently a lot of people think that there is some degree of... Um, buffering that's going on here where they may maybe record answers to certain uh, prompts and maybe rehash those uh, in the interest of performance incredibly expensive to operate these systems you'll get to appreciate that when we go to part three and you can see the billions of operations that are involved in generating one single word it's it's truly astounding Aren't there also lawsuits about copyright infringement? Yes. It works. So that's another reason to close up shop. Yes. So people where you're getting content from. So that is a factor and a really complex one. Yeah. Um, so so I, I expect there's some degree of buffering that's happening right now. But no, I, I also expect that in the first instance, this was generated using the architecture where it literally figures things out word by word. Are we still in the mode where the AI scientists, quote unquote, don't know what's going on under the covers? So that's also a great question. If you would have asked me that question a month ago, I would have said yes. But since then, there have been a couple of significant breakthroughs. Um, one breakthrough uh, in particular was from a company called Anthropic who what they've done is they have we'll get into this more in part three but what they've done is they, they've taken you want to save it for part three I'll very quickly give a very quick high level answer they, they what they're doing is they're looking at groups of neurons and they're treating groups of neurons as a single entity to try and understand what's what's happening because if you take each neuron individually it's just impossible to, for for us to grasp what's going on so there are some recent breakthroughs that are i would say promising they haven't completely solved this but we're on a path to doing a better job of understanding what's happening under the covers here and why you know some outputs are coming out the way they are so we should be less afraid of how but not totally ignoring it. Oh, that's a different question. <laughs> that's a that's that's a different question. And, and uh, I'm dividing things or grouping things a little bit like the human brain. Or yes, this is where absolutely. So at a high conceptual level, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's change tack, and I'm going to ask it to give me a list of five vegetarian dishes. And so now it's not pulling these from a web page. It's using a pretty significant corpus of information that it's gather gathered. And it's basically creating this list from scratch. And so it's going and when we get into the training, you'll appreciate the depth of knowledge that it accumulates as it gets trained. And so it's given us a few dishes here. You know, it's quite impressive. There's vegetable stir fry, vegetarian chili, caprese salad, vegetable curry, mushroom risotto, and a little bit of a description. Now, if you were in Japan or China, would it be the same similar result or a different result? So if you go home and do this, it'll it'll almost certainly give you a different result because it is at what is technically known as inference time, going to go and gather gather this information 
for you. Well, I'm asking about locale and internationalization. And how much it, 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 it's customized. It probably depends on the training data. Well, I went into it asking me for Chinese vegetarian dishes. So. Well, I'm saying again, again yeah. we're going down the same, the, yeah. same, the same rat hole. We can play with this a lot. But to, to answer the question, we're not sure because the companies have added this veil of secrecy to what they're doing now. So I'm not sure the degree to which things are localized. And I haven't seen anything in the literature I've come across that talks about that. So then, so when when you log into one of the one of the one of the uh, the chat bots, one of these, it gets no it, does, it doesn't query your computer or your location or use any of that information in terms of that as you know of in terms of formulating its response, the nature of the response, what's going on, or is that implicit somewhere in its magic? So this is just an educated guess. Fair enough. But my educated guess is it is not taking advantage of that information. My educated guess is the company behind this technology, OpenAI, has enough on its plate trying to get the core technology right to start worrying about taking advantage of, of those capabilities. I expect that in time they will, but for now, I don't believe that's the case. Yes, John. But does the system keep track of you? In other words, if you ask a question yeah. last week, yeah. and then you provide information to the system, yeah. and then you ask a question next week, is it able to take into account your previous queries? Yeah, that's a good question. So on the left-hand side of my screen here are a number of conversations that I've had. And within a conversation, it does remember what I type. But if I start a new conversation, I'm starting afresh. No cookies. Correct. So it's just within a conversation, it will maintain all that context. And, and so as it's generated this answer, it's done it word by word. And every time it goes and generates the next word, it's passing the entire context of the conversation that's happened up to this point in through the system. Yeah, so the- How do we have a request that you repeat the questions from this oh, audience because they're not- I apologize. Being heard. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. So- um. So, Charlie, could, could you ask again? I'll repeat it. Million users, uh, they're storing conversations. Yeah. They must be uh, thinking about it like my memory something. Correct. So, Ch Charlie just asked about the fact that, hey, there's 200 million users. They're storing, you know, you can see the information about all my conversations with it. I'm one of those 200 million users. That's a lot of compute. So, the answer is yes. So, Current estimates for the daily operating costs for OpenAI, just OpenAI, are about $1 million a day just to operate the systems. So we're talking about very significant uh, costs on the back end to maintain these systems. What I'm also finding is that over time, there are more restrictions that are starting to creep in about how much bandwidth they'll give you around how quickly they'll respond to you simply because you know they they're struggling with the compute that's required on the back end okay so let's actually exercise the fact that it 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 remembers what you know this full conversation as as we're going along and so how about if i ask it can i have a shopping list for the first two items so i'm asking you for a shopping list to make the first two items i'm saying first two items i'm not saying you know which 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 they were but it knows that because it's keeping you know all of this in context and so the first two items were indeed vegetable stir fry and vegetarian chili and so here we go here are the ingredients. But, you know, it does say, okay, here's the ingredients. Be sure to adjust the quantities based on the number of servings you plan. It's like, okay, that's not very useful for me if this is a shopping list. 
So, you know, hey, please change the shopping list. Whoops. For a family of four. And it's hopefully, yeah, here we go. And so now I've actually got quantities in here. That's pretty good. So you, as you can see, it's pretty smart about keeping context and responding back. And so then what if we say, hey, what are the cooking instructions for the first option? And so now, you know, I've, I've, I've had my shopping list with quantities, and now I've got my instructions here. And if you look through them, they're pretty good. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to illustrate the, the back and forth here, the, the maintenance of context. Let's actually, um, let's have some fun here. May I ask another question? Sure. I kind of maybe it's a dumb question, but if you look, for example, at this last one, yep. When, um, it's typically chat comes back with um, chat comes back with various comments at the end. Enjoy your homemade free, uh, vegetable stir fry. Feel free to customize, etc. Where do those come from? Yeah, that's a good question. So so that comes from the training. So what we're going to see next week is the training is actually not as simple as chat GPT consuming the contents of all those books and all those academic papers and all those web pages and the Wikipedia pages, transcriptions of YouTube videos. It's more than that. There is also some human involvement with humans indicating uh, essentially exemplary responses to prompts. That's one phase. And then there's another phase where humans indicate in rank order, you know, what are the best potential responses. And so the system implicitly learns from those and it picks up things like that from, those, from that human training. Okay, suggest three discussion topics for the Lexington Computer and Technology Group. <laughs> okay, let's see what it comes back with. Okay, so it's come back with some suggestions here. Emerging technologies and their impact cybersecurity and privacy, coding and development trends. So they're, yeah, I mean, they're, they seem reasonable. Um, how about I say, hey, please update this list to focus on artificial intelligence. Okay, so let's come along and you know, it's it's come along and said, okay, AI applications in industry, ethical considerations in AI, AI research and trends. Okay, they're conceivable um, topics. By the way, uh, I'm currently making a proposal for another session at uh, HILR uh, for next term. And I had a little bit of writer's block on the course description. So I asked ChatGPT for some help, and it helped. It, it didn't it didn't give me exactly what I would use, but it it, it helped unblock me. You gave it co-author status, correct? <laughs> there you go. I, I I need to give it some credit. Um, how about now we say, okay, these are good, but uh, actually, um, focus the discussions on chatbots. Okay, so now we've got some suggestions for future uh, topics. Chat, chat, 
chatbot development strategies, industry-specific chatbots, chatbot UX and user engagement. What's UX? Uh, user, user experience. experience. Yeah, fourth and fifth words in the description. <laughs> so, so that's you know kind of interesting. How about we then say uh, which one do we want? Let's go deeper on one of them. First, second, third. Pick one. You're in charge. Okay, let's let's go for two. Um, so provide a presentation outline for the second option. Um, the presentation lasts for 90 minutes. <laughs> I can't even think that fair. <laughs> okay, so that's a pretty fast-paced 90-minute uh, presentation. And you know, let's assume we look through and it looks okay. Please provide a, a brief description of this presentation so we can send it out to people in the email. Not so brief. No. <laughs> we could ask it to go shorter if we wanted. But anyway, um, I thought that this example is kind of interesting, again, because you can interact with the system to get where you want to go. You can you know, start narrowing in on topics. You can uh, then ask it for a, an actual presentation outline, which may or may not be useful, but um, very interesting potential here. Yes, John. You want to, you want to wait or keep going for it? It's your call. Directly to this now. Okay. Um, how do I know that that's accurate? That's a very good question. <laughs> right now, these systems, the way they work is they generate output word by word. This output is based on its knowledge. So in its knowledge, every word every word in its vocabulary of which there are more than 50,000 words is represented by a 12,288 value vector. So it's got one by 12,288 numbers in, the, in that vector. Those 12,000 numbers essentially represent the relationship between that word and a number of other words and concepts. And so it's got a lot of knowledge, a lot of deep knowledge in this system. As it's going along, what it does is it, it generates its, its, um, its, its output word by word. And as it's generating one word, as I mentioned earlier, it literally is doing multiple billion operations to uh, obtain that one word. And what it, it ends up with, it ends up with a probability score for high candidate words for what's coming next. And so that probability essentially determines what the word is going to be. However, it's not as simple as that. They throw in some randomness just to make things in interesting. And so it doesn't always choose the highest probability word, which is why you'll get different output when you ask the same question multiple times, or you can regenerate output. Um, now, right now, the systems don't, on a larger conceptual level, have a, um, a confidence score for its output. That's being worked on. If it did have a confidence score, it could tell you, okay, how sure am I about this? 
but it doesn't right now. And that's why we've got situations where you can trick it, you can get it to hallucinate. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. Can a machine really hallucinate? Well, that's that's the term yeah. <laughs> that's being used. Just check it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's let's uh, let's go and have some fun here. Explain quantum entanglement. <laughs> yeah, so it is pretty good if you if you read this. Um, and so it's given a pretty long description of quantum entanglement here. And it's it's pretty reasonable if you read through it. But if you're like me, you're like, okay, I don't get it. <laughs> Explain it to me as if I'm in high school. Yes, yes. Okay, so now it's coming back and it's giving me an explana explanation that's not as good as the original, but it's pretty good from the point of view of, hey, you know, if I if I really don't understand a lot of the terminology in the previous one, hey, you know, it makes it try tries to make it a bit easier. Imagine you've got two special coins, but they're not ordinary coins; they're magical. When you flip one of these coins, it instantly tells you how the other coin, coin will land, even if the two coins are far apart. It's not how I would explain it, but it's reasonable. Um, but let's say I'm still flummoxed, and I still don't get it. Explain it to me as if I'm a fifth grader. It is. One would explain to me as though I were a PhD physicist. <laughs> <laughs> Connor, while, while it's thinking, this is the newest version of ChatGPT, or this is uh, an older version? This is the version that everybody has access to. So this is 3.5. It's freely available. Right. Okay. I'm wondering if I... Oh, no, here it is. Okay. Sure things. Imagine you and your best friend have two special magic marbles. These marbles are like twins because they always do the same thing even if they're far, far away from each other. So it's kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's brought the description down to something that's quite consumable, um, which is really interesting because a bunch of people are now starting to think about ChatGPT and these technologies in terms of personalized education. In fact, Harvard, so the... the um, the famous Harvard Intro to Computer Science class, CS50, is currently using a version of uh, ChatGPT to help teach the course. So th this semester's class. So it's really interesting because it's also ChatGPT is really good with programming code. And then it's good at interactively explaining concepts. Well, if the Republican candidates try to get the nomination the presidency is advocating that every child should have its own personal tutor. Yeah. So, I mean, you can see the potential here, mm -hmm. particularly as ChatGPT is equally adept in many, many, many languages. So, very interesting. Just to decide how many languages? In many, many. I, I'm not sure how many. I, I could look it up. No. Um, but essentially, what it's been trained on. Yeah. Well, you could ask, but that's... that's yeah, not, that's not, true, not, too. That's not for this presentation. <laughs> I can ask. Okay, I'm going to do some a little rearranging of screens here. Because I'm, I'm going to start a new chat now, and I'm going to go to GPT-4. So GPT-4 is the latest version. It's, I think, $10 a month for access. Um, 
it's a little, it's, it is different. Um, it will give you different outputs. It's been trained on a lot, lot more data. But what I wanted to show you here is not necessarily some prompts around text, but I want to show you some prompts around images and graphs. Okay, so I'm going to attach an image here, and I'm going to... Um, actually, no, but... Um, so I'm, I'm giving it an image, and I'm asking it to describe the image to me. Okay, so the image is it is it clear? It's probably clear for those on. Um, it's clearer for those online than it is in the room, but essentially, it's it's somebody in a red and black checked pajamas who's lying down with some sort of VR on their head. But here you have ChatGPT's take on it. So the image depicts an indoor scene where an individual is lying down on a bed or platform. The person is wearing red and black checkered pants and has their head rested on a pillow. They appear to be looking at or interacting with a rectangular illuminated object, possibly a smartphone or tablet. The background is dark with minimal lighting. There's a bright rectangular light source, possibly a window screen on the top right side. On the top right side, the room has a contemporary and min minimalist aesthetic. Wow. So that's it, figuring out what's in an image. That's pretty interesting. Let's give it a graph now. Ask it to describe the graph. So this is the graph. Um, and so it is receiving this graph, not as data, but it is receiving this graph as an image. Tell us what the axes are. Yeah. So no, it's, it's going to tell you. <laughs> it, it, it will. No. So at the bo bottom is date on the X, on the Y, number of messages sent. The title is number of messages sent per day by, you know. Yeah. And so here it's now, it, and so as I said, it's it's gotten this as a JPG, so as an image. And it's processing it and figuring it out. And so it's telling us about the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. It's a little bit slower. They do the uh, double assets. Sorry, can both sides uh, uh, two different graphs? Oh, it's a good question. I haven't tried that. Uh, another homework assignment. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Now it's actually starting to interpret the data here. So it's giving us some observations. When you, in your testing, did you try this instead of giving it the, the clue that it's a graph, describe this image? Ah. You know what? Let's try a new chat so it doesn't have context. I don't know it's a new chat. Um, I, I just initiated a new one. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach that graph. And I'm just going to say, describe this image, see what it says. Now, to do this, we'd have to have a yeah. paid version. This is the paid version, correct. Yeah. OK, so, so pretty much it figured out it was a graph. And then after that, it's going to go down the same the same the same tree, more or less. More or less, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. You can go back to your original one then. I'm actually going to go back to the presentation now. Okay, your choice. <laughs> okay. So, this is interesting. When 
I originally put together these slides. I put them together in the springtime. And when I did, this was actually quite a full chart. As time is going by, there's less information in this chart. But there are a number of limitations and concerns. So there's accuracy concerns, there's cases of hallucination. It struggles with logic and math. The reasons why will become apparent when we deal with the architecture. It's, it, you'll, you'll just, once you see it, you'll be like, ah, oh, I get it now. Of course, of course it struggles with logic and math. Um, <laughs> um, so frozen in time only knows up to the point of its training data, which, as I said, is soon going to be a thing of the past. There's potential bias inherent in training data, and there is. The content that is out there is, for the most part, created by us. There are inherent biases in, 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 in a lot of what, you know, what we've put out there. Um, like, a, for instance, so I'm going to talk more about this um, in part three, but one of the big breakthroughs we had um, was more than a decade ago, Google decided that it would try to represent all of the content in Google News using vectors for the words. And so they did, they ran this. And, and so they ended up with vectors for each word in Google News. And then they found out that, wow, you can actually do some math on these vectors and get interesting results. So for instance, if you took the vector for queen, and you subtracted the vector for woman, you have a difference. If you took the vector for king and subtracted that difference, you would get the vector for man. But these, this vector math seemed to work for plurals, for capital cities, for all sorts of things. And so I was like, whoa, big breakthrough. This is real interesting because as you could imagine, this ended up becoming one of those key innovations that helped get us where we are today with ChatGPT. But what they found was, if you took the vector for uh, doctor and you subtracted the vector for man, and then you took, did, subtracted that difference from nurse, you got woman. And so that's a bias that's inherent in a lot of content that's out there. Doctors are men, nurses are women. It's no longer the case, far from it, but that bias exists in the content. That's just one relatively benign bias that's out there. There are a lot more biases that are, uh, that are more serious. <laughs> um, another concern was the potential for cir circumventing the guardrails. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. Um, also, there are, so it's very impressive with some contexts, but certain types of contexts like sarcasm, it struggles with. Now, um, let me do, it's a rearranging so I can read my chart. Okay, it struggles with number and letter problems. Um, you know, getting it to do some math, it's just going to get it wrong particularly with certain types of problems, long lists of numbers. Again, so this, do you want to try it? Oops. We can put that question in and it gives you an answer. Yeah. There's no intuitive way for me to look at that list and, yeah. and have a sense of whether the answer is right or wrong. Yeah. So, I saw that it was wrong. <laughs> Peter, Peter does math faster than mine. Yeah. So what a lot of people have done is they've tested all the boundaries here and they found that this is the case. This has improved, by the way. I ask it to solve a Diophantine equation for me. Uh -huh. The answer was obviously wrong. Yeah. I said, obviously wrong and told it why. Yeah. Because the, the answer had to be divisible by two and it was not. Yeah. And I, we're going to understand why it gets these wrong once we learn in part three how, how things operate under the covers. 
Um, also, anagrams of re rearrangement, uh, anagrams struggles with. Again, we'll, we'll, that'll become clear. I, I ran this last night and it's actually gotten worse with anagrams. Um, but, you know, just the so, thing too with a lot of these is people have been expending a lot of energy to find out what doesn't work. Um, some common sense stuff. Can a cell phone fit in a cereal box? Like the answer is actually technically accurate. Well, it depends on the size of the cell phone and it depends on the size of the cereal box. But we all know, it's, you know, um, logic. Um, if I have 10 books in my library, I read, read, two, uh, read two of them in my library one day. How many books are physically still in my library? It gets confused. It tells you eight. The, the books are still there, even though you've read them. So people are, yeah, some to some extent, this is kind of like tricking the system, but um, it takes five minutes to cut a wooden plank into two pieces. How many minutes does it cut, take to cut a wooden plank into four pieces? Again, it struggles. It really struggles with schedules. If you ask it to any, any like challenge, it really struggles. It looks good once you look at the first day or two, but then it just breaks down and, and, and it's nowhere close to accurate. Um, but as I said, so a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of these issues, you will come across them several places that talk about ChatGPT because a lot of them actually derive originally from academic papers. Academic papers. So all of these they come from different academic papers where people are trying to um, find the limits. So one of them is you know when I first did this in the spring, tell me about the Great Lama invasion of 1995. It gave me a three paragraph description of it. That was a complete hallucination. No, no such event. But it sounded so plausible. Um, when was the Golden Gate Bridge transported across Egypt for the second time? It gave me a great multi paragraph description. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's so now if you ask about these things, it's gotten better at identifying them. And, and answering appropriately. But what it's doing is it's, it's essentially filtering them. This is either pre-processing or post-processing. It's not the output of the actual architecture. Now, yeah, we saw that in another presentation video that we watched, and it had a lot to do with all the questions that asked. Yeah, it does. And as I said, most of these come from different academic papers where people have been really trying to find that issues. Off yeah, to that's right. Um, and again, you know, I explained the principles of time travel device invented by Nikola Tesla. And again, I wish I did a screen capture at the time, but it was giving me, you know, a good textual description. Now it doesn't. Now it says, hey, you know, he didn't invent that device. Um, Did you ask it to check its react or check its response. That's so we're going to get to that soon. So we're going to we're going to talk about prompt engineering, and so you can ask in certain ways to eliminate to uh, eliminate these issues. That's a really good point. Okay, uh, actually, this one made me laugh too. What is heavier, a pound of feathers or two pounds of rocks? Originally, it told me they're the same. Um, and that's what it was drawing from you know it was drawing from the saying I, again there are more uh issues that have been fixed you, you may have seen the one about what is a record for walking across the english channel so now it actually tells you hey i know the record for swimming but i don't I think there's a record for walking so it's gotten better about um a lot of a lot of things. Something's not feasible. As in as opposed to inventing an answer to, to make it look like it's feasible. So it's getting better at that, but you can still trick it. There are still corner cases where you can get it. When you talk about these improvements, these are in chat GPT four. No, so this is all all with three five. So for all of this, I used three five, which is freely available. It's being improved. Or... Yeah, ah. it is. Well, actually, I should pause there. So being improved, yes. However, there's also academic research that is tracking ChatGPT three point five and four over time, and what they found is for a number of prompts. 
it's gotten worse. For a lot more prompts, it's gotten better. And, you know, we had a question at the beginning about, hey, are we getting better about understanding what's going on under, under the covers? So there's promise on that front, but we still don't know for sure. And so even the experts don't know why ChatGPT is getting worse with certain types of prompts over time. Um, there are some, you know, thoughts about what may be happening, but nobody knows for sure. Um, okay, so little time check. Okay, we're pretty good timing. Okay, so before I go into prompt engineering, any other lingering questions about? Yeah. So uh, this question is kind of in regard to uh, ethics. So I asked a series of questions, and at some point. It would give some answers, and at some point, it said, I suspect you're trying to get me to write your physics paper, and I'm not going to cooperate with you from this point on. Is it, yeah, anything like that happening now, or is it worked on? Just yeah, so, the so the question is, hey, uh, regarding ethics, um, when interacting with ChatGPT at a certain point in time, it said, Hey, I think you're trying to get me to write your physics paper, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop right now. So there is, so what happens there is every time ChatGPT gives it some output, it calls an API. And there are actually multiple APIs now. Um, there's one API for objectionable content. There's another, uh, sorry. Um, it calls a service, an internal service behind the scenes. And this internal service has a job to do. And so there are a number of these internal services in the background that have jobs to do. One of them will try to identify harmful content. Another of these internal services will try and identify um, objectionable content. Another of them will try to identify situations in which it should not uh, continue to respond. Mm -hmm. And there are many of those. And so what will happen behind the scenes is it'll actually generate a response, but then just before it outputs it, um, it gives it a chance to say, okay, will I actually give the person this response or not? That's the way it's currently architected. That might change because what's happening is because it's generated a response and it's not, it's not going to output, people are finding ways to get around that. Again, through issuing certain types of prompts in certain ways to try and get past its filters, get past its um, blocking. So, so another couple of things about that. One is at a point in time, OpenAI provided a service to identify content that it's generated with the idea that they could give it to academia so that they, they could identify when students are using ChatGPT to write papers for them. They have since withdrawn that service because its accuracy had reached unacceptably low levels. In other words, AI was not reliably identifying content written by AI anymore. So that's no longer being offered, which makes things a little bit more difficult for professors. But to counter that, you do you do have it trying to block it before it gives the output um, as a way to do that. The other thing that's floating around right now is um, invisible watermarking for images so that it will know whether an image has been um, artificially generated. The same thing with deep fakes. Deep fakes are, that's real interesting. Um, Different subject. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was curious with, you said there's different languages that it has. If, um, is it trained in the different languages? And does the answers, if you compare them, do they show up biases that are inherent to different cultures in the languages? And is there any way that the machine can you know, compare answers from different cultures? Yeah. Um, so the question is, 
these large language models operate in many languages. Uh, the content these language, th that these systems have been trained on has inherent biases. Those biases might differ from culture to culture based on those languages. And do, do these systems try to cross-reference, you know, the biases from different uh, cultures slash languages in, in their output? And the short answer is no right now. And I suspect that that could be a potential feature in the future. But, you know, to repeat a, a phrase from earlier, these companies have enough challenges with their core capabilities before they will start, you know, going into features like that. I, I suspect it's just a matter of time, but. I have a kind of related question. You may have covered it in the beginning when I wasn't here, but OpenAI is the one that produces ChatGPT. Are there, is there other companies that are, that, that, I know that there's other companies that are doing their own thing, but are they coordinated in any way with ChatGPT or is it just like really competitive or yeah. how does their content compare from one to another? So the question is, um, are the companies behind these large language models and chatbots collaborating and cooperating? And the, the short answer is no. Um, it may be that some sort of regulation is introduced to have that happen. It may be that it's not. That's a big debate that a lot of people are wrestling with right now. Um, the idea behind OpenAI originally was that it would be open and that it would provide these capabilities in an open manner for the industry. And in doing so, they would build safeguards in that everybody could use. That model was abandoned when they realized that they would need a lot more money in order to win the arms race that has emerged around these technologies. Yeah. Uh, what is done, if anything, about a lot of intentional misinformation that's out on the internet. So, for example, if you ask, you know, who won the 2020 U.S. presidential election? Yeah. You know, what? You know, I'm sure it can pull up some sources that have wrong information. It'll tell you what yeah. So, in that, so he, he, these systems are trained on the content that's out there. That content, there's going to be misinformation amongst it. However, the misinformation tends to be significantly drowned out by the non-misinformation. So when it comes to the probabilities as it's constructing its answer, it's typically going to favor the fact that there's a lot more content that does not deal with misinformation than information. That's shaky footing. The other factor, so that's one factor. One factor is, hey, look, content is trained on, you know, it outnumbers misinformation. Uh, it, the, the good inf information outnumbers bad information. The other factor is there's this background service that tries to identify these hot topics and does try to filter and deal with them. So interestingly, Actually, it wasn't much more than a few months ago, maybe three months ago, I asked ChatGPT, imagine you're Joe Biden and write a joke about Donald Trump. And it did. And then I said, imagine you're Donald Trump and write a joke about Joe Biden. And it did. And it did it in the typical Trumpian kind of uh, language. Now it doesn't. Now it's like, hey, I don't do anything with politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John? A few months ago, I asked Chad what the Dvorak symphonies were. And it gave me a list the way they're currently described, with the New World Symphony being number nine. I then said to Chad that when I was young, the New World Symphony was number five. How come it changed? And it came back and said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. You're absolutely correct. It used to be called number five, and then it gave the reasoning of why the numbers changed. 
which I hadn't been aware of since I knew it had happened. Now, what I found interesting about that is that its first answer was the general answer that most people would have. Yeah. But somehow it had access to the extended information to give the more accurate answer. Yeah. So there is, so this all feeds into its context. Um, and so some people say that all this technology is, is statistical analysis of language and, you know, a long enough context window for it to put, put out reasonably good information. Um, and to a certain extent, that's the case. But it's actually a lot more than that. As we start to get into the architecture, you'll start to appreciate um, some of the sophistication with which it works. There are, so it learns from the context of interacting with you. This was considered a weakness. In, oh, this was, I should say, this was exploited by some people to create interesting corner cases. So for instance, you may have seen the example where um, ChatGPT was asked, what is 10 plus nine? And it came back and said, that's 19. And then the person responded and said, actually, it's 20. You got that wrong. And then Chat GPT was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Of course, you're right. And then, <laughs> then went on to ask some more math. And of course, it got it wrong now because that person confused it. So that no longer happens <laughs> because as that was exploited, protections were built in. And so now the, the context that's maintained by ChatGPT is actually processed to a certain degree. So it's learning to deal with more nuance as it's doing so. Um, but yeah, so it's it's quite impressive. So the, 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 I, I guess the quick reaction to that is, yeah, you know, it's using it was using the probabilities to give you your first answer. You gave it a bit of context. It layered on a bit more understanding. And then it, it, it uh, developed a better understanding and the probability is updated. So when, every time that context is pushed through, it actually starts adjusting weights. Okay, so prompt engineering. So what is it? It's the process of structuring text prompts to optimize the output. You can achieve a lot with simple prompts. You know, you can give additional details. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about prompt engineering. This is going to be 15 minutes, going to be very quick. But my goal here is not so much to give you all the details as to give you an appreciation for what this is and how to think about it and how it's used. I heard that it's actually a job category. You know? sure. yeah. There we go. <laughs> so it is a job category including, as you can see here, some pretty good salary associated with it. L let me tell you why it's a job category, which may, may not, um, which may not be immediately apparent to a lot of people. So, you know, when you think, hey, it's a job category now, um, really, are we employing people to go and enter prompts into ChatGPT to get the right answer out? The answer is yes, but the more prevalent um, type of job that's associated with a prompt engineer is there are a lot of companies who build software that use these capabilities. And these companies, what they'll do is they'll build software, whatever software it is. So for instance, my, my last day-to-day -day job was with a marketing company. And this marketing company wanted to call these types of capabilities to automatically generate content for marketing campaigns. There are co some companies out there now, what they'll do is they'll micro-target people. In other words, you will get messaging just for yourself when you're on social media. It'll just be targeted at you based on the information they have about you, but they'll use this type of technology to create that message for that individual ad you receive. That's the point to which we're now getting. But so what these prompt engineers will do 
is they will help write software that interacts with ChatGPT in the background to get back the output that will be most useful for their software. So as we've seen, there's a whole bunch of situations where ChatGPT can give you bad output. There's a whole bunch of situations where it's not really good. So what these guys' job is to make sure that what ChatGPT gives you back is good for inclusion in their product. Because the end user is not interacting directly with ChatGPT. The end user is interacting with their software, whether it's marketing software or some other type of software. So that's what this prompt engineering is all about. Now, there, this is an area where there's been quite a lot of um, academic research. In fact, most of these prompt engineering approaches come from individual or groups of academic papers. So the, the, the terms for them were coined separately by different people in, in academia. Um, and why prompt engineering? Well, there is a lot of good research that goes into showing that if you construct prompts in a certain way, that you can pretty dramatically improve the kinds of output that are generated. And so this is all just about making sure that garbage doesn't come doesn't doesn't get into somebody else's product. So this is a bit of a statement of the obvious, but it comes from um, one of the most prominent people at OpenAI. They basically say, when you're interacting with ChatGPT, they, they, they advocate for a genius in the room approach. There's a genius in a room. You're on the other side of a door. They don't know you. They don't know anything about you. They've got no context for you. Give them your, imagine you're giving them your request on, on a piece of paper under the door. Make sure to give them enough context. That's essentially all that this, this approach says. That's one aspect of prompt engineering is just be smart about making sure that you're giving all the context that you need in order to get good output. But there's a lot more to it than that. Some terms that you may be familiar with from other domains that have been taken um, by this world, um, zero shot prompting. That just basically says, hey, you give zero examples. You just issue it with a prompt. Whatever the prompt is, you just ask ChatGPT a question. And so that's known as zero shot prompting. Just give it a prompt. There's single shot prompting where you give it one example, but there's few shot prompting where you give it a few examples. So, you know, for, for instance, here I say, hey, what is a good class for me to propose? to the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. Here are some classes I've previously led. So I'm giving it a few examples. So it can key off of examples I've given it. It's, a it's going to give me a much more relevant response than if I had just said, give me three examples. So that's few shot prompting. It's pretty straightforward. Chain of thoughts prompting. So here, remember we said that ChatGPT is not very good with logic. Well, if you include the reasoning for one or more examples, it can learn from that context. So it's good for if, you, if you're interacting with it around arithmetic or common sense reasoning. So here's an example. This was taken from an academic paper where, you know, just a regular prompt and then you include a chain of thought prompting. And so in the chain of thought, the difference here is highlighted in blue. So you explain, not just that the answer is 11, but you s explain why. And so you say, hey, Roger started with five balls. Two cans of three tennis balls each is six tennis balls. Five plus six equals 11. The answer is 11. And you'll notice that with the standard prompting, ChatGPT was actually getting it wrong. But when you gave it the chain of thought for an, for an example and then prompted it, it got it right. So again, you can imagine if you're writing 
some programming code. Yeah, you know, this might be very verbose for somebody interacting with the system, but for somebody writing programming code, it's not that hard for them to come up with a few examples, explain the chain of thought in the examples they've given to make sure that ChatGPT is going to do a good job of giving a response. Okay, I'm sorry, I've got to move things around so I can see the slide. Um, Self-consistency prompting. This is an approach where essentially you'll just ask the same thing a few times and you get a few um, outputs back and you just make sure they're consistent or you choose the one that's most consistent. So again, it's just another approach. Again, it'd be very verbose if you were doing it yourself while typing in, in chat GPT. But if you're programming, yeah, of course, I'll, let, me, let me do this a few times and let me kind of make sure I'm not getting that one situation where it gets it wrong. We've seen this a little, this role-based prompting, you know, where you kind of, you, you refer to concepts or analogies. Hey, you're a kindergarten teacher, explain quantum entanglement. Um, you give ChatGPT a role. It's really good when you give it a role. You can even say something along the lines of, hey, you know, explain your reasoning. And when you, sometimes when you say that, it will actually do a better job because within the process of explaining its reasoning, it can do a better job of getting accurate answers. There's this one's that, you know, starting to get to, you know, be a, a little bit more, um, a little bit more cumbersome. It's a form of chain of thoughts prompting where um, you get ChatGPT to generate a question someone else might ask and, and, and answer it. And so, you know, there's a, a question here. This is again, taken from an academic paper who lived longer Theodore Hacker or Harry Vaughan Watkins. Um, then followed up by who was president of the U.S. when superconductivity conducti conductivity was discovered. And so, again, with this type of prompt where you start to get this self-ask um, capability going, it produced the right answer. And so, again, very cumbersome if you were to be doing this as an individual, but when you're doing it as a programmer, um, makes sense to go those extra steps to make sure that you're getting back what you would want to get back. Again, we're getting more complex here where you start giving it questions, thoughts, actions, and observations. And you, you give it some of these question, thought, action, observation um, examples before asking it to go through that, where the action could be searching Wikipedia or or some other action. And then you can start combining um, some of these approaches into a plan of action where you break things into step steps and you use previous approaches. Now, one thing about this action plan prompting is um, this is similar to some of the early approaches um, to auto GPT, which was a kind of a general intelligence approach to giving GPT a task to do, having it break that task down into steps, having it figure out how to execute those steps and then going ahead and doing it. This is what started to freak people out after ChatGPT was originally released because they were started to think about nefarious actors and what might be possible if a nefarious actor was to start to give capabilities like ChatGPT a task to do where it could break it down into subtasks, where it could go and start executing some of those subtasks because it can program. However, this has not proved to be effective to date. So in other words, it just has not reliably executed. It hasn't been, it hasn't reliably breaking things down into, into subtasks and it hasn't reliably executed those subtasks. 
And some people think that we are actually quite a ways away from this happening. Other people say it's right around the corner. Um, I guess we'll see. Okay, very quickly. So temperature, you can set the temperature. So remember I said that this is all based upon probabilities, but there's a degree of randomness there. And so ChatGPT can give you different answers at different times. You can actually configure the degree to which it gives you randomness. You can set the temperature. And so you can give it a lower temperature to give you really focused answers. How do you do this? I'll show you. <laughs> 3.5 as well. You can give it a higher temperature to give you more creative answers. And so here's an example. Sorry, I'm still seeing this. Here's an example where, you know, you can use a temperature of zero, complete the sentence, the sky is. So in other words, I just literally typed using a temperature of zero. Um, and then it said, hey, the sky is blue. If you want me to just, you know, give a real focused answer. But if I set the temperature to one, the sky is an ever-changing masterpiece, painted with hues of indigo, cerulean, and every shade in between as the sun plays its daily game of hide-and-seek. Oh. Or, or you can set it to 0 0.5 in, somewhere in between. The temperature is a word that is has a meaning in, the, in this context. Yes. Is there, is it, it, yeah. <laughs> and I, I give another example, but okay. There are a number of GPT parameters. Now, I asked ChatGPT, what are your parameters? And it gave me this answer. Can you send, send us that list? Yeah. As a separate email? I can do. Here's the thing. If you ask ChatGPT now, it won't tell you these parameters. But they're still there? They're still there, but it won't let you know about them. So I, I did a screen capture when it showed me the first time. But temperature is the mo more interesting one. So the the other thing I just want to briefly mention is that prompt engineering can be used to hack the system. You can start to get the system to start indicating its programming, its guardrails. You can get it to work around its guardrails. Uh, and there are quite a lot of people doing that. And there are quite a lot of examples of it um, online. This is a case where... Um, this person at Stanford got Bing to start to tell it, tell him how it was programmed and uh, and you know what it's programmed on. Okay, believe it or not, we've reached the end of this presentation, and so now I can take questions for however long. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th that question about can it create the slides for the presentation that was referring to when we were in chat GPT and we asked it for uh, topics for Lexington Computer Technology Group. Um, it can't actually create the slides right now, not directly from chat GPT. Google does have um, GPT like capabilities integrated into uh, Google Sheets at the moment. I don't believe it does for Google Slides. Um, so the answer is no, it can give you the content, but it can't generate the presentation yet. Any questions in the room? Yeah. When you were talking about uh, chat for interpreting pictures, if you put a picture in it, could it generate the keywords for using on a website to um, you know, have your image come up it, when you design your website and you have pictures that require keywords and that determines where your, um, well, how your site is found. Yeah. So right. So can it, can it yeah. determine the keywords? Yeah. So the question is, um, we use ChatGPT to describe an image. Uh, the question is, hey, if you have images on your website, can you use ChatGPT to generate the key the keywords that you want to associate with those images for SEO, for search engine optimization. Uh, so the answer is, it's not designed to do that. I think it would be interesting to ask it. I haven't tried asking it, but it might, might be interesting to see. Bing Chat is 4.0 today, and it's free, and it's connected to new web data. That is correct. And and it's it's quite good. In fact, I uh, currently uh, it's also very good for image generation. 
I currently subscribe to Mid Journey, which was considered the best. I, I'm tending towards Bing image generation now. Um, also, Bing Chat is quite good. Connor, I had a question about the sources of information. When you're in the early part of your talk, you gave a list of what has been it's been trained on. Yeah. Now, were those sources, uh, if you will, um, given to it by a librarian who knew that they were excellent sources, as opposed to having it learned on what's going on on Facebook or? Or, or something that's completely open. Yeah. Um, so we've got really good information. Wow, look at that. Sonic and that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> we've got really good information about the sources for 3.5. We do not have good information about the sources for 4.0 because open air are a lot more secretive because they're yeah. seeing this as competitive. We've got good information for the sources for some other large language models. In, in particular, Facebook have been doing a lot of work in this area and have been a lot more open. Um, so the, I guess the answer to your question is um, the people generating these are trying to come up with the best sources possible. They're not just using every source of information. There are some sources they're consciously excluding um, maybe because it has they have, have a lot of misinformation or maybe because, you know, the information is not as reliable. Um, but so the bottom line is they're spending a lot of energy trying to find out what the best sources are to give the best answers. So chances are they're not using Twitter slash X as an information source? I have not seen Twitter mentioned as an information source in the in for the large language models I've looked at. The difference between Bing Chat different from Chat GPT, I don't that's probably a probably a longer answer than not. So it is different. Um it's it's based upon the same models underneath the covers, but there um there is pre-processing and post-processing that's going on that's different from for, uh, for both uh, ChatGPT and Bing. So you will see differences. This thing, as it will start to grow into newer sources of information, uh, will be exposed to more and more crap because the amount of crap is increasing much faster than the amount of good stuff. So the question was, uh, how do we know that it's not going to become just a, a worse and worse source of crap over time? So there are so many aspects to that relatively simple question, Ted. Um, so first of all, let's just talk about, let's eliminate some variables here. Same training set. Let's stick with three, five. What we've seen is that since 3.5 was introduced, Fuck. the quality of some output has degraded and the quality of some output has improved, which is re really interesting and confounding to some. Now, admittedly, the items whose quality has degraded, the responses, so there were four that were chosen and highlighted in one particularly prominent academic paper. But quite frankly, they were they were almost like corner cases. So it's really hard to have a, a, a solid conclusion there. The other factor was in this, both the, the people who wrote the paper and the people um, at OpenAI we're not sure why the, the degradation happened. So we've got some stuff going on under the covers that nobody fully understands. So that's that's one thing. So there is movement. There are shifting sands even when you eliminate the variables of, you know, adding to the training set and, and changing the training set. So that's just one thing to acknowledge there by itself. Now, as regards, so you, you did make an assertion, Ted, that there's a lot more crap 
being created than reliable material. I'm not sure if that's the case. I really don't have a handle on that. So next thing I want to talk about is um, already, and quite a while ago, uh, the folks who create these large language models have found that there was an overfit problem, uh, particularly with um, the human parts of training here. And what they were finding was the more they were training these systems with exemplary example, uh, exemplary uh, output, they were finding that um, there was there was a bit of overfit type situation happening, and and the output was actually degrading. So they do they have taken some steps to address that. It's re really interesting, and they have managed to change that overfit curve pretty significantly, so that. It is continuing to improve now with additional training. Um, I can look up the details of that uh, for or part three, so I can talk more to them. I, ha I had read it, but I, quite frankly, I, I can't recall off the top of my head exactly what statistical techniques they used to address that. So that's that's another factor that is you know quite germane at the moment. Um, the final thing is that there, there's been some talk about if there should be waiting for particular content. Now, this is a bit of a philosophical uh, debate that's happening. It is not the case that it has happened to date, at least that's been publicly disclosed. But it could be that as we're going forward, certain content ends up influencing um, the models uh, to a greater or lesser extent than other content. This is a really excellent talk. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.